Welcome back to Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined on a massive week by Anthony Haggerty and Amy Canavan. Monday, 12.30, not only do we have the Dundee United game to look back on, we're looking ahead to Wednesday night's encounter with the current league leaders. That could all change and it's transfer deadline day. So massive amounts to talk about, but let's start off with Dundee United, Amy. I mean... I remember back in the day that was a that was a trait of Celtic, you know, the last minute, uh, the last minute winners, and we'll remember the video, the mic top video that came in for a bit of flack at the time by some from some quarters when Angie's saying uh, we don't stop, and I tell you, we didn't stop on Saturday, did we? No, we didn't. Um, relentless in a way that. I say relentless, obviously, because yeah, as 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 you rightly pointed out, Celtic don't stop. But it was it was it was pressure after pressure after pressure, um, and eventually got just rewards. It was a fantastic goal as well. I think you don't mm. think you can, obviously you get lost in the hype of the last minute winner, um, but there was no scrappiness kind of involved. You know, it's it's the perfect delivery, um, and it's perfect takedown from a bad eye and ensuring that obviously it does hit the back of the net. But it was just something, like you say, just something a little bit different. I am. Um, from from Celtic than what we've seen, you know, um, relentless in the way that dominating as expected, um, but not getting that end product, but pushing on to the end because you know so many times over the past few years you would have just seen right, well it's going to be a nil nil, see it out, and you think right, well the narrative would then be look that's Rangers drop points earlier and Celtic can't capitalise on it, you know, and that's the way that it was kind of looking, but just to keep going and to, to have that energy bringing on Jota and Juranovic totally changed the game, you know, absolutely everything, and I know we'll, we'll touch on that, um, and it goes without saying their importance, but no, it was just, it was pleasing in a number of factors, and just proved that, you know, there is that other side to, to Postacoglu's way of play, really. No, there definitely is. I noticed myself, Amy, on the live stream, the post-match, obviously you put it up there and you've got the amount of people waiting and when Abada's goal went and it dropped by about 500. So that, I mean, wasn't, yeah. that wasn't Celtic fans no. that was waiting to come in. Um, when we're talking about don't stop, Tony, we no longer play a wannabe Edward at Celtic Park. Should we change it to don't stop? The backwards tune from the Stone Roses. Um, when I was looking at Dundee United, I've got to say, you know, I, fo- I focus mainly on Celtic, but that's twice they've came to Celtic Park and given, a, given us a, a good challenge, Tony. Yeah, but I think people who were saying that they were worthy of a point was a bit wide of the mark. They did hee-haw, defended well. Goalie was an inspired for them. It was kind of similar to the game they played the last time at Celtic Park, except they, they, they got a goal. I'm just thinking of all our new Japanese listeners typing in Google Translate hee-haw, <laughs> right? And I don't know what the translation of that is. <laughs> no, I mean, people were telling me how great Dundee United were and they were, they were fantastic. Celtic scored the last one to go with two players in the box and 10 Dundee United players defending, right? So you can skew a narrative whatever way you want. They came and they contained Celtic, but don't tell me that they played really, really well. They did it to the best of their ability and had an inspired goalkeeper. But if Celtic hadn't have won that game, then of course the narrative would have changed. But they kept going and they won it with 10 men. Don't forget, when possibly as Amy said, they could have just settled for the point. It's not in their nature. It's the, it's the way Celtic play, but you know, is, 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 that, is that what constitutes playing really well? You negate and you stop Celtic from playing? My goodness. You know, so I think if you're a... In terms of just desserts and rewards, Celtic got their just desserts and rewards because they had the the creative and flair players on the park who were trying their damage to break that kind of tangerine wall down So and, and, and did so in the end. So I, you know, I... I think if you're a football purist, you were glad that that actually happened. You know, it was a, people say it's Saturday was just one of those days. It's a Carlsberg Saturday, two last minute goals in two different venues with two entirely different outcomes, right? You know, and to give you the chance to go top on Wednesday night. Now, Celtic's bottle was questioned as well. Yeah, there were nerves surrounding their performance, but we got the job done. And as Amy touched upon, what a brilliant goal. And I'm talking about the actual finish. The cushion to set yourself up to rattle it. And he's not just gone for it. He's got the whole goal. He knows any kind of connection is putting that in the net. But he, 
he hammers it so that the because a goalkeeper's been in inspired from so it doesn't hit off him. It goes high. He's got no chance of getting it. But to have that coolness and calmness and composure in the last minute, knowing this could be the last chance saloon for a twenty-year-old, I thought that was no bad. Ah, it was excellent. When you look at the challenge that Dundee United gave us in the two games at Celtic Park and the challenge that Livingston have given us in two games this season, the difference on Saturday, of course, Tony, was that we came out on top. And that was the first time, if you look at those four games, um, that these two teams have challenged us and challenged us well, albeit, as you say, not for the purest. But we came through this time round. What does that say about the mentality shift that uh, has been implemented at Celtic since Ange came in, that we're now winning these games that we were drawn in the past. That to me, or Amy? To me. Yourself, Tony, aye. Uh, listen, you, you, that was the epitome of don't stop, wasn't it? These guys have now got momentum. And, and bearing in mind, Paul, there's five or six arguably first-team players missing from that Celtic lineup. So these guys have kind of been thrown together, but they've all got the memo, haven't they? You don't stop and you get it, and there's a mentality in that dressing room instilled by the manager is that you just keep going, and they're all buying into it. Big time. Matt O'Reilly was cracking again on Saturday. He's missed chance apart, but, you know, there looks an accomplished footballer there. Real Hitati, you know, maybe not as influential as, as the Hibs game and the Hearts game, but, you know, you look at him and you think, that's a player of real technique. You know, and they've only had a few training sessions together and a few games together, so they will get better. But this momentum is, is, is building and building and building. But, you know, a lot of sales well, I can't wait to get a hold of Rangers on Wednesday night and all that. Just, you know, urge caution. And just say, look, they're still a good team. They're still at the top of the table. You've not beaten them since 2019 in the league. Just keep your feet in the ground. But if you turn up and you play, then you've got every chance of winning the game. But just, you know, Get real, be get realistic for this minute in time, and don't get swept away by it all. Because it's all right saying oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Still, got a chance to go top of the table and prove that they're now worthy challengers, and they've got you know the, the, their credentials are there for all to see. So we'll reconvene on Wednesday night, but just keep your feet in the ground. And like the manager always says, it's no, it's not about being top in February. So we've been talking when the trophies handed out, but this is a, a great chance and it's testament to, as you say, the, the players and their mentality that they've put themselves in this position. Because, what, was it six points? If you, no, even a fortnight ago? And we were told that it was, you know, that, that was kind of done and dusted and, you know, as the managers kept saying, we'll just run our own race. We'll just do our own thing. But you've got a massive chance to you know, for everybody to get a feel-good factor again by beating your rivals for the first time in two and a bit years. And good for Ange, it'll be good for those players and it'll good, be good for the supporters. Yeah, it'll be good to be top of the league for the first time since Ange has taken over. Amy, you pointed something out that uh, Lawrence and I spoke at half-time during the game that it's not really in his habit uh, for Ange to throw a couple of bodies on at half-time. Didn't expect it to happen. Uh, but it was pivotal in the outcome of this game. When you look at the performances of both Juranovic and Jota, I mean, he's completely changed the left-hand side of the park. Rather than, and I've seen a wee bit of comment coming through saying that it was the wrong team to play, rather than look upon it like that as a starting 11, I would much rather give Andrew credit for making that change at half-time, for identifying it. It was a bold move at half-time. Amy, do you think he's getting enough credit for that? I don't think so. I think... Uh, rightly as you say it's more you know that the start and 11 was wrong um hindsight is a wonderful thing i don't think you know when the team line came out i think i was certainly surprised but you can think right with wednesday in the mind and he knows obviously the importance of giranovic and particularly jota um and you can understand why he, he didn't start them just i don't want to say rest um because i don't i don't like saying that when it's a professional player but you know just you're it's all about Rotation and you've got good players still there in, in Ralston and obviously James James Forrest first and Abad on the other side. Mm. Um, but no, to notice that and to act 
you know, how many times have we came on this podcast over however long and we'd say, right, 70 minutes, 75 minutes, and there's still not been a substitution made, just to act quickly. Um, and to notice, obviously, to get Abada back on his right side, really, um, and and to bring in the just the lineup play that Yota and Juranovic have so early on, I, I think it's it's a joy to watch really. And they just inject that pace. Two guys that really get it as well. I know there's been a lot of talk about that recently. Who gets it? Um, but I don't think Juranovic is possibly getting the the praise that he deserves as well. And this is coming from a Tony Ralston fan. Um, but you know when he's in the side, the the, the levels just go up that extra extra mm. level. Um, and I know for that reason you think that he should play. You know on the left and Ralston come in on the right. Um, and I, I can understand that, but I think you play your best players in their best position. And I think for me then, that means that Juranovic is your right back from from now. Yeah, I mean, that will come up in the conversation when we're looking at the potential lineups, And uh, I'm more inclined to agree with that uh, anyway, Amy. And that is not any uh, kind of uh, downer on Tony Ralston because, you know, there is a Tony Ralston Appreciation Society on the Axon Bulletin on a Monday. Paddy Lavery, welcome back. You're in there. You're first to post. You're on YouTube. Great interview with Tom yesterday. Well, if you haven't seen it, tune in. Alan Thompson was talking to a Celtic State of Mind all about his new book, his career, his uh, future. Uh, lovely fella. And I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Get yourself on the YouTube channel. There's loads more interviews like that coming up on a Celtic state of mind. Paddy Burns is buzzing for Wednesday night. Can't wait. It's incredible. You wake up on the Monday, you're already talking about the Wednesday. Uh, Sean F., we will be talking about incomings, outgoings. We desperately need, says Sean, a left back, a right winger, and possibly another central midfielder. Injuries, internationals, and suspensions show we lack quality and depth. But people are saying this is a good window. Well, you ask yourself, and we will talk about transfers in and out as we go, but you do ask yourself, how many players are you going to bring in? I mean, we're sitting on 18 at the moment, Tony. Uh, the word out of Celtic Park, um, obviously it filters into various people who are ITK, and you read up on this uh, on the social media. The word is it's going to be more outgoings than incomings, and uh, unless we get an, uh, an O'Reilly-type kind of proposition where it's too good to turn down, we're not really expecting any bodies to come in. Uh, would you buy into that? Certainly, as I've said before, Tony, I wouldn't ask Ange the question because he's answered it already. Uh, but do you buy into that? We're quite happy with the business and we might get a few bodies out the door. I thought he was pretty clear on that. <laughs> for, those that, for those that missed it, I thought I was pretty clear on that. <laughs> so it's, It was a wee look on his face, Tony, that wee grin. Yeah. 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 But I'm fully expecting somebody else to come in. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> He's, uh, you know what he's like. He just he, he loves the verbal combat. He loves the jousting. And he, he he loves the mind games. He just and he has a certain way of dealing with the media, as you know, mate. So what well, you know, not that. I, listen, he's like every other manager. If something comes up, it's doable and it's workable, and he think it will add to the team. He'll do it. You know, but so how he, he doesn't know. He doesn't know if that's going to be his last dealings in the transfer window. Maybe outgoings he's possibly thinking of. So how can he say last week, that's me, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes to him on, on transfer deadline day and says, look, here's an offer you can't understand, never mind refuse. You know what I mean? So I, I'm, I'm with him on that. So, so, so if somebody asks me a question and, and they get that snippy answer back, so be it. But I think you're liable to see Celtic uh, more outgoings. But I, I'm still convinced somebody else will come in. I could mm. be wrong that assumption. <laughs> we'll have a wee chat about, if so, who is it? I mean, we've looked at some of the, the outgoings, the, the rumours. There was a, a very strong rumour. Uh, it was coming out of Belgian football, actually, that Uruguay uh, is going to stand and got in a wee conversation with the Belgian football podcast who have been on Axon before talking about Jack Hendry and they reckon it's the best place for the boy to develop, get games uh, develop uh, in confidence, but also technically and uh, we know what they did for Jack Hendry's career. It was transformative over in Belgium. If the boy can go over there, Osazi, because he's not going to get games at Celtic between now and the end of the season and get some games, then it's the right move for him. I've also read, uh, and we've suggested this, a Yeti stock, yeah, they might, it might be kind of low in the UK at the moment after you know his time at West Ham and Celtic, but they'll remember him well and fondly in Switzerland, Amy. So they're talking about Ball coming back in. I'm guessing that'll be on loan. And Barkas, perhaps going to Gothenburg, but 
there are two players um, that I would have expected to be in that list. The first one was uh, Ball and Golly. I'd have not heard much around Ball and Golly's future. And I think this goes back to what Tony says. If you get a move for Ball and Golly, then a left back becomes an option again, doesn't it? To, to bring him in. Uh, and the other one, you know, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but Mikey Johnson's not been in the squad for the last three games. And I don't think he was a confirmed injury, but please correct me if I've not picked that one up. Um, do you think they might be looking to loan out Mikey Johnson? Do you expect Ball and Golly still to leave? And do you, if so, do you expect a last minute left back to come in? It's a weird one. Um, I'm really surprised at Ball and Golly. You know, there was a lot of interest, especially in the summer from from Turkey. There were a few teams um, that, that were in, but I've not personally I've not seen heard any kind of links for for him. He's kind of been off the radar. Um, for Johnson, I'm really surprised, um, especially the the kind of the hip slant. I thought after Boyle going, that would kind of heighten things. You know. Johnston was pictured at, at St Andrews a couple of weeks ago, um, speaking speaking with him. So I am really surprised at that one. Um, Adam Montgomery as well is one that we obviously spoke about last week. That's mm. not necessarily off the table. They just need in Kelly to offload some players. Um, their books are too big right now. Obviously, Derek McInnes is getting getting his team in shape. So I wouldn't rule that one out quite yet as well. Um, but I think, and I, I can't really blame them, I think if Scott Allen's still an option for... Come on, they will really try and press for that. Um, but I'm a little bit surprised, yeah, about Johnston and, and Ball and Golly. I think it's, it has been a bit weird that there's been no real talk at all of Ball and Golly actually this this window. You think, you know, I know you can't force a club to take somebody, um, but you think if that's who, if you wanted somebody to get off the books, you'd basically want it to be Ball and Golly. Like you say, it, it frees up another. Um, potential to, to bring in a left back. Seen Ryan Sesson Young's been doing the like uh, doing the rounds again this morning. Um mm-hmm. I don't know if that's just regurgitating a, a um there was obviously the links back in twenty twenty I think. Yeah. Um if it is, I, I don't really know if I'd take him. It's not the Ryan Sesson Young of, of twenty twenty either. Um it's not kind of worked out for him at Spurs. Um but you know there obviously there used to be a player in there so there's still got to be something in there but um, I don't know how much life there is actually in that room or if um, it's kind of kind of came around overnight and, and heightened up a little bit this morning. But um, I, I'm not I'm not too sure, but I wouldn't rule it out. No, you're right. I've also seen uh, Lee Buchanan, Derby County, Wayne Rooney's came out and said he's going nowhere, 20-year-old left back. Um, but it's like Tony says, I mean, these things are moving at a rapid speed rapid pace. You just need to look at the ticker tapes on the news services and the players are moving all over the place and the situations are, are going to change left, right and centre as the day progresses. I've been pretty impressed with some of the clubs that were uh, getting these players out. I think Conor Hazard's move Tony to Helsinki was a was a surprise uh, but fair play to him and I hope he goes out there and gets loads of game time. We've, we've obviously built up some kind of relationship with Ostend, I'm guessing because we've done a bit of business with him recently, and Osazi Uruguay is away there. I was chatting on Twitter to a Sheffield Wednesday fan last night who was surprised that Sean Uruguay came to Celtic in the first place. And this was a Wednesday fan, of course, who had seen them, you know, breaking into their first team, Tony. Um, would we put these two maybe down to legacy signings? Because it doesn't seem as though there was a there was a plan. There wasn't a, there wasn't a gateway for these guys to play in the first team, and they couldn't play in the B team. So they're, they're just surplus to requirements, aren't they? Without a doubt, I think you only have to look at what Andrew inherited when he came in to know that the transfer policy has taken a completely different direction or has mm-hmm. been taken in a completely different direction. And there's one man who's taken it in that completely different direction. That's the manager, isn't it? Yeah. And he now doesn't have... I think it's fair comment to say that the manager seems to have full control over the football department, doesn't he? Because the players he wants are the ones that are getting signed, are the ones that he's rec- he's recommending, and that started with Kyogo, didn't it? Which had clearly the hands of Ange Postecoglou all over it, and ever since that, the players that he's wanted and ha- and he has recommended, the club has bought. We're all for that because we trust the manager, don't we? We trust his judgment, and I, and I've said before, and you, you say if players have a natural position then people at the club have a natural position, don't they? And a natural job and a natural role. Football managers should oversee everything in the football department and more more so than anything, the recruitment of players. And I think he's got that working relationship with Michael Nicholson that Michael Nicholson says, OK, 
if it's affordable and we can do it and mm -hmm. we have those financial parameters obviously at Celtic then we'll do it we will get the players that you want and I think so far that's 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 the way it's been working it's certainly work, working that way in January isn't it yeah I mean um, br bringing players in by committee Tony I mean a lot of big clubs do it you know the, yeah. the involvement of uh, the board for example and a lot of the signings at Liverpool under Brendan Rodgers uh, was very mm -hmm. much like they would present him with signing yeah. options, you know. But the way that Ange has gone about it is it's a needs must situation because of what he inherited, Tony. Of course, and he, he well, you just said they brought in eighteen players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over the two windows so far. He, he he said it himself. He said he wasn't forceful enough in the August window because he was clearly recommending players, and they were maybe saying, "Well, we've got enough players. It's a you know, there's a bloated squad there," and he, and he was thinking. You might have enough bodies, but you've not mm. got the quality and you've not got the players that I want to play my system. So clearly along the line, that communication has been established because he's now bringing in players to fit a system. So if you trust the football manager to do his job, you know, you're not bringing in quantity. You're bringing in quality to go seamlessly into a football team. You know, that first team ready uh, angle about players now. And that's what I like about Ange because he's clearly said, you know what, this is my remit. It all comes mm -hmm. down. He always says it, it will fall back on me, and he'll take all that. And he love that's the kind of pressure side of the job that he loves. But what he has shown, he's got an eye for a player. So see if you just listen to the guy who's got an eye for a player. And as Brian Clough used to say, you just dot the eyes, cross the t's, son. Give me the money. You stay your tip. You know what I mean? And, and that's and I think Ange's kind of got that going with Michael Nicholson. Uh, I don't know for sure, but it seems to be that kind of relationship, doesn't it? But it does. whenever he does sign a player, he's always quick to credit Michael Nicholson and say, you know, we're working in tandem and, and credit the job that he does, I write the checks and stump up the money. Yeah. So I'm quite for I have say I think the Celtic supporters are quite fortunate that we have these two guys in the position that seem to be on the same wavelength and want to take Celtic to that next step. 100%. I mean, how how often have we concerned ourselves, Tony, with things like battles of egos yeah. behind the scenes, stopping transfers, uh, making the manager unhappy? Michael Nicholson has gone largely under the radar, other yeah. than the fact that he's done his job well and we're, we're praising him for it. But he's not coming out and we, we've been asking for engagement. We've been asking for communication. He's going about his business behind the scenes, getting the job done, taking care of business, as Elvis used to say, Amy, that, that was before that, your time. That's what you want. You don't want to hear from them, do you? Until such times when it's like the financial things or, or an AGM. Yeah. That constitutes a good CEO, to my, opinion, to my knowledge. I think the thing as well, Tony, is we became accustomed to having that to yeah. figurehead at the club, didn't we? You know, I mean, McCann was a powerful figure. Um, and then, you know, not too long after his departure, we've got Peter Lowell coming back into the, the club in 2003. So there was only really a, a space of four years where we didn't have that figurehead, but we became accustomed to it. You know, Lowell was at the club for 20 years almost. And uh, now we don't really have that, but it's still effective. Now, we're going to have to speak about some of the performance performances on Saturday, Amy. And I'm going to start off with Jota. I mean... One thing I love about Twitter is is the amount of things that are captured and shared. And you've got Jota just, I mean, that's iconic. There has been a few iconic moments, but Jota actually celebrating that victory with the fans is up there. You know, it's one of the ones that you're going to see it on canvases in the future. It's going to be in the history books. There he is. Um, let's just say he's, he's come back into the side after his injury, Amy. And it seems to me, I mean, looking back at the last game against Rangers, we played Kyogo out left. It wasn't effective. The stage is set on Wednesday night for Jota, is it not? Yeah, um, that like, I just have to smile thinking of that, that video. It's, it's, I am old fashioned the way that I hate, you know, like when the camera pans and you see all the fans like out with their phones and it really annoys me because I'm like, oh, I just live in the moment. But I'm so glad that like, I think, and then somebody actually captured it and saying that though, that only there was only two phones like actually in that whole picture. But for whoever it was um, who did get that video um, of the one, obviously really up close, it's amazing and it will go down um, in the history books because it is great and you can't help but not smile and just think. As I kind of alluded to earlier, like oh, he's just that guy that gets it. Um, 
but yeah, he's going to have a massive, massive role to play on um, on Wednesday, and that's why I can understand why Ange didn't start on um, um, on Saturday. Just wanted mm-hmm. to make sure that you know he's fit and fine. And because um, you look when he came in against Aloha, and you're thinking, well, that's the guy off the back and injury, and look how he just came in like hit the ground running. So he's obviously he's not needing all this, um, you know, a lot of rehabilitation time or whatnot, but. I think what would just get everything going right now is if he signed today. Um, I, that's still just the big, you know. Would, would you be happy with the transfer deadline? There you go, Ryan, afternoon, happy deadline. Would that make you happy, Amy, if that was the only it permanent would, signing? Yeah, um, Yeah, I would. Obviously, Carter Vickers as well, but I'm not trying to be greedy. Um, but yeah, you can have them both. But um, no, if I had to pick one, it would be it would be Yota. Um, and I think it has been a great window, but I think that would just make it, you know, um, I don't want to say perfect, but pretty much the most perfect window I've ever seen in my Celtic time. Um, this is weird for this is really weird for a transfer deadline day to not be thinking right. We're maybe linked to four kind of unknown entities, only maybe brought in two throughout the window. The fact that most of the business has been done, yeah. and just obviously said that he's happy up until now anyway. But um, yeah, f- for both of them, but particularly the author. If that permanent signing came through, um, I think I would just top the day off. So if anybody sees him uh, filming some kind of video with the social media team at any point in Glasgow, give us a shout. Buy him more furniture for Ikea. See, see if you wanted to keep that momentum and feel-good factor going, and it was possible to announce that. And both drop it now. Wanted it, you would drop it now, wouldn't yeah. you? Because you would just, I mean, do you know what I loved about that video? It wasn't so much, you know, I mean, Jota's celebration was, was pretty iconic. Was it Juranovic who was holding his legs? Yeah, like holding his sure legs. He, to make sure he wouldn't fall, to yeah. let him enjoy the moment. I, I love that. There, right. you know, there you go. There's two guys who have came from completely different footballing cultures, different countries, mm-hmm. and, they're in that, and they're in the moment. And yeah. they have bought into what the managers said, another guy who's came from another country, and we spoke about it last week turned us into a culture club, right? They, they're getting the culture. They just get it, right? It's a big, big thing for Celtic supporters, players that get it, that you've actually got a guy going mental because you set up a last-minute goal, so important, you've got a guy holding his legs so he doesn't fall, so he doesn't damage himself, so he doesn't get injured, so you know, so something disastrous happens, you know, but probably holding his legs and screaming like a banshee as well beside them, and you're just thinking, wow, considering where we were in I July, know. August, when this man inherited that team, scenes like that you thought were a million miles away and you're building and building. You won the first trophy of the season. You don't want to get ahead of yourself. You don't want to say too much. But And I know why the Celtic supporters are looking forward to playing Rangers and, and when like because there's an air of confidence and there is momentum. Are they there for the taking? Of course they're there for the taking. I get all that. But you've got to go and perform. And if you've got that Portuguese winger on for them, and he performs, then you get more than a, a chance of doing it. But you know, the, you just you just see certain things falling into place. The the they don't stop going to the last minute. Everybody saying it was reminiscent of the centenary team. People no leaving because they're like, there's three minutes of injury time and all that. We'll, we'll still do it. That Billy Connolly quote settled in. There's a minute and a half to go. You know what I mean? We'll win this. That kind of thing. There's that kind of. Mm-hmm. We're making them building, isn't it? It just keeps building and keeps building and you pick up on certain moments, but just daft wee things like that. You know, like Kyogo rubbing your man's knee and all that camaraderie, that spirit. All of these things are just, you know, you just say to yourself, and I wrote a piece in the Celtic way saying, not only is, and I said it hasn't even started with the beautiful house analogy. You no, know, he's just, you know, the foundations are being laid and all that kind of stuff. And I said he, he, he's building a, an immovable object and an irresistible force. That's what you seem to be thinking. That's in your head and you're thinking, where is this going to go? You know, where can we take this? And I agree with Amy. If you can conclude the Jota deal, then you would just be like that, wouldn't you? You'd be like singing and dancing going into Wednesday. And if you could do a Carter Vickers as well, so be it. But again, that's fine. And there's no great urgency to conclude those deals. But you're talking about timing. You know, see if see if this can, if you can do this, if you can get this over the line. Read the in time, the room. Aye, the timing of that would be impeccable, wouldn't it? So he's up for an emergency podcast if it happens. Then, aye? yeah, 
Oh, ten, 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 ten to midnight, I'll give you a shout. I'll dial you in, right? Well, John, let's, put, <laughs> let's put it this way, we're not chasing Skerpovich or John Gadetti. <laughs> and, and what we're also not doing is a good point. And what we're also not doing is trying to get a marquee signing in that, that just appeases the fan base. You know, we're not trying to do that. There's a strategy in place here. Um, John Sweeney McCarthy won't last the first half for me. And we don't have attack midfielders options from the bench. We need a couple more in before the transfer window closes. Well, John, if anything happens, we'll be back live, even if it's myself and a bottle of uh, San Pellegrini. I will be on. We will do uh, an emergency podcast if necessary. Now, we can't go through that game without bringing up a couple of the other performers. And uh, Leo Labada has been the subject to a lot of discussion on a Celtic state of mind throughout the season. I think overall, for, for a guy to come in at his age, um, uh, his, his performances have been absolutely astonishing. You know, he only cost three and a half million pounds. I know that we're getting used to buying guys in for one and a half and them being outstanding, but three and a half in this day and age, for a guy at that age, a full internationalist, uh, 36 games he's played. So for a, a 19 stroke 20 year old, a lot of a lot of football and he's been involved in 20 goals, scoring 12 and setting up eight. Um, I'm going to go back and reiterate something that Tony said earlier on, the composure, Amy, of a 20 year old to bring that ball down, kill it and then finish it was astonishing. Great ball by Jota, of course. But Leela Bada, I mean, I'm looking at him now. I'm looking at the form of James DeForest. I know he started on the left. He is definitely your first choice of right winger, isn't he? And I know that, that Jim on Axon reckons he's maybe more effective through the middle. But when we're lining up on Wednesday night, you're looking for Jota on the left and Abada down the right, aren't you? Yeah, he's just, you know, he probably came under... No, I don't want to say criticism because I wasn't criticising him, but he was singled out, you know, obviously the, at the beginning, at the start of the season, you know, the, the three, Kyogo, Yota and Abada, plaudits everywhere, insane. And then it really just kind of focused in on Yota and Kyogo and Abada was dropping off a little bit. And then it was the time James Forrest was, you know, coming back into the fringes and we're like, right, well, this will maybe give Abada a little bit of a kick up because he's, he's not hitting the heights that he had been hitting. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to say that's criticism because it's it wasn't like that, but we just he wasn't performing to the best of his what we'd already seen really. But of course he was still young. Um but you know, no matter what, you can eat whatever you want after that because these last few games, especially since the break, even a little bit before I would say, um towards the tail end of, of um of December and whatnot, um I think he's been absolutely outstanding outstanding. Sorry, he's been so crucial to Celtic um and, and everything that is going well. He seems to have a little bit of confidence in him again. Um he's taking man uh, men to the byline, sorry, and getting a cross in. And he should be taking every defender right there at the byline because he's got the, the pace to be doing it. He, he's crossing and um un, undeniably sorry improved. But I just think that he's almost feels like he fits in now. Um, mm. I don't know if there was a little bit... Again, he's he's younger than me. Um, and there was just a little bit of, of worry. I don't know, but he's an integral cog now. And I think he knows he's worth it. He knows his place in this side. Um, and he's firing on all cylinders. And it's, it is a joy to watch. Amy, there comes a point, and it happens very quickly, where like football managers are younger than you. And it does happen to you, Amy, right? Because when like you start, <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, when you start watching football and you look at Paul McStay and he's like 26, 27, you think, wow, he's ancient. Mm -hmm. Oh, my words. Uh, then the managers are younger than you. In fact, some chief executives in Scottish football are younger than me. Tony, <laughs> Leo Labada, again, you're looking at his progress uh, in a Celtic jersey. That was one of the best games he's played for us, I think, at the weekend. Um, and I mean, there's been a lot said about. Brendan Rodgers being at the game, and I'm not going to say that he, they're interested in Abada, but it's, it's only a matter of time when you're talking about guys like Jota, Kyogo, Abada, Hatati, that these English vultures will start circling Celtic Park. I don't expect it to happen this January, but how do we protect our assets? Can we protect our assets? Isn't that the kind of caveat of the, the platform that we give them? You know that you can come to a, a massive club, and you know pe personal happiness is, is, is all you're going to, yeah, and, and possibly the, the carrot of Champions League football, and just building something. I don't think he wants to dismantle it with within a year. You know, and he will say to these guys, I'm sure, as long as the manager sticks around and has that vaulting ambition, mm. the club, and it is vaulting ambition, and and people uh, in the board have the same or share the same vision. 
And I think you can hold on to these guys for maybe longer than you thought possible. Roger said that in a lot of his players, didn't he? Yeah, yeah of course. They had that belief. They, they, they believed in him. Yeah. Trust me, go on the journey with me. Yeah. And then after it, we'll all see, we'll reconvene. You no, know, give us two or three years. You no, know, don't just leave the first window or whatever. But I think Andrew, will, I've got drummed it into them that there could be on the cusp of building something special. You know, when you're talking about a bad, a 20 year old, I mean, I touched up on the finishing or the touch and the finish. <laughs> Again, do you know what I loved about the celebration? Love the fact that Cameron Carter Vickers got his jersey. <laughs> Aye. And I'm yep. talking about different things like that. That makes a team. You've got yeah, Carter Vickers getting the jersey, Kyogo tidying up the rubbish, Juranovic yeah. holding on to he got his legs. You know? that's, a team, that's a team in tandem, isn't it? That's a team mm-hmm. singing from the same hymn sheet. Guy's going off, he's not, I mean, went wild. Go, ran off the park, took and his went back, went back for a wee bit more after it as well. Yeah, right. And Carter Vickers is standing there for an eternity. Put this back on. You need, you need to put this back on. I know you've just got a Leo. Get the shirt back on. You know what I mean? He's just like lost in the moment. But Carter Vickers is like, right, bring yourself back down to earth. Here. You've still got five minutes of this game to see out because there was still still five minutes injury time. So, you know, get yourself back in the, the ball game, that kind of stuff. But that's a team working in terms of something. Do you know, see the return of Forrest? It's been the best thing for a badder. Good point. Do you know why? Because he's raised his own bar and he's realised, this guy's going to take my jersey mm-hmm. if I don't perform him. You know another good thing about a badder? He can't play through the middle. Right? So you're going to debate. The next one you're going to debate is Jack and Marcus, right? And people's opinion will be divided. They'll be at one end of the spectrum or the other. But a badder can play centre forward if called upon. I prefer him out wide. But if he has to come inside, I'm cool with that as well. You know, and, and that on Saturday will give him every confidence that he needs to think, do you know what, see the chance comes along on Wednesday night, I'm going to do the same, I'm going to bury it, I'm going to be clinical. But the return of Forrest, and people can debate whether Forrest is, you know, I still like Forrest, still got a valuable contribution, but if he can help in the growth of a badder, then he's been with Gordon Strachan, you still always say, be a good teammate. Mm-hmm. You can spur the other guy on who you're vying for, and the two of you are playing consistent football, it's a good thing. The manager knows that as well. Ange knows that. But a bad I've seen Forrest over his shoulder. He's just raised his own levels, hasn't he? Because he did dip, as Amy said. And it wasn't a criticism. It was just a dip. The yeah. fact that a 19-year-old, when he came in, he's now 20, has set such a high bar. With 12 goals and 8 assists, what a contribution that is. And he's still getting used to the game up here. Isn't he? He's oh, still, yeah. You know, so he's still, still kind of bedding in, but he's grasped. He's grasped it quick and he's grasped the the notion that you have to win football matches. And he did I mean the, how tempting was it to swing at that on Saturday and sky it or hit it off the goalkeeper or, or miss or miss it. It would have been easy to miss it. He didn't miss it. He buried it and he made sure he buried it because he knew it was the last chance that they had. And I go back to it. Celtic had two players in the box. In fact, did they have two players? They had two attacking players. One was Jota who found him in the box and Dundee United had 10 players. And people keep saying to me, what a brilliant Dundee United performance. Seriously? You know, one team tried to win, the other team tried to contain. The other time they came and they played one each, they came out to play, they created a lot of chances and they were worthy of one each and I praised Tam Courts and the, the bulletin that we had on the Monday. I can't praise that. I, I refuse to praise that. They, well, just because you contained and you defended well, you, you, you deserve something. There was a team going all out attack to win and, and their goalkeeper was an inspired for them. So, you know, I, I get back to it. Celtic won that game. Deserved to win that game. They did. Do you think, Do you think Tony, after we destroyed them, and we did destroy them at Tanadice, that they've obviously thought their game plan is going to have to change because that could happen again when they came at the weekend and obviously they've shut up shop and, and they've changed their game plan to try and combat Celtic's free, free scoring, rip roaring, never boring football. Haven't a lot of teams thought that against Celtic this season? Yeah, some of, some of did it. Was but we found a way. We found Lund- a way. Yeah, Livingston and St Mirren in particular did it, and Dundee United to effect. But on Saturday it was different because they did find a way. And in, 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 in a match when their bottle was questioned, their temperament was questioned, 
It was being questioned live on the radio, not an act song, but on the radio it was being questioned. The credentials were being questioned. Mm-hmm. Right. You play, I mean, did, did they play till they scored? Oh, my. You know, then and I get back to it, they won the match with 10 men on the park. Yes, yep. I was going to actually move on to beat on before talking about Yakamakis, which will work into the uh, predicted 11. But Simon comes in and has instilled that relentless attitude of never giving up on winning a game. 100%. He certainly has. And I don't know if, if this is Mark giving us the Japanese translation to hee haw uh, from at the beginning of the show. But if it is, Mark, thank you very much. Um, Near beat on gets sent off. And we've been praising them. This season on Axon, he, he got a bit of stick at the beginning against Mitchelland. He's a he's one of the senior pros. Were disappointed with the way that he conducted himself and getting sent off there because it really, you know, set up, set us up for a really difficult task in the second leg um, away against Mitchelland. But I'm finding it hard to be annoyed at him for this one. Emil, come to yourself first, right? I mean, the first booking he takes one for the team. It's a counter attack, and he brings down Tony Watt. And you think, well, that's worth a booking, right? Yeah. The second one, we should already have had a free kick because Greg Taylor has been impeded at least twice, maybe even three times. And that's the frustration because beat on then, yes, in isolation, he brings down the player. That would be a booking. But the frustration is surely the first um, issue is Taylor getting brought down. And I think that's what frustrated me. And it clearly frustrated Beaton as he's walking off the park. So what was your feelings around near Beaton? I mean, some sympathy towards him? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been a critic of him in the past, but I think, again, probably since the beginning of December, um, obviously with the break included, I think he's been one of Celtic's most important players. I think he's been so consistent. Um, just very unrash, which is very unbeat on. Um, and I know, you know, folk will look at it and go, oh, there's beat on getting our sender off. But I, I completely agree with you. You know, Taylor should have already had won a free kick and, you know, game should have been away away from there, basically. I, I'm with you. The first booking, not got a problem with it. If he didn't take that foul, you don't know what kind of trouble you could be in. Um, I think they're good fouls to take. Um, and that's his experience coming into play that he can read it and knows that you know just let's just annihilate the situation, get bodies back, get men back. Um, but yeah, Taylor, I know. Then I've seen quite a few. You know, Taylor cost beat on it. Well, he didn't. He was fouled, and it should be you know a, a free kick for him. So he's going to be. A, I, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this, but he is going to be a massive miss on Wednesday. Um, because of his experience and just how well he's been playing and hence why the banner today is what it is um i think he's really grown into the captaincy as well and, and he's kind of relishing it you know the having to be the experienced head the vocal guy um and he's just i don't know if it's because he's not got a mcgregor or a scott brown beside them that he just does get to dictate kind of that whole defensive midfield himself that he's really just using um all his expertise but i think he's, he's done so commandingly so far so he is going to be a miss. Um, and, and yeah, I do feel a lot of sympathy towards him and I really feel for him. But you've got to hope that, you know, Andrew's obviously up until now praised him to, um, so, so much and rightly so, not just, you know, jumping on it. Um, and you have to hope that obviously once the, the ban has been served out that he, if if he's the best option, he, he does still get played because he's he's been a great servant for, for Ange so far, offered a lot when others haven't been... Um, obviously available and I do think he is going to I think his presence is going to be missed on Wednesday and I think it will be noticeable Yeah, I mean it begs two questions really Tony I, I agree with uh, with Amy he has grown into this captain's role even to the point where he's tried to grab the game by the scruff of the neck against Hearts and take a wee run down the right wing and he won a corner and I can never remember beat on trying to beat somebody for pace and doing that but he did um, but on Wednesday night there's two questions to be answered really a, who is the captain? And B, who fits in uh, as the number six? We've got a couple of options in there, and that is a debate in itself. So first and foremost, do you agree with Amy? Um, Amy's assertion around the beat on red card, a wee bit hard done by? Aye, I think he, I think everybody felt sympathy for him. I think Greg Taylor should have done better with possession. And I know he was fouled, but he just seemed to get his angles all wrong, Greg Taylor, and then go about trying to retrieve the situation wrongly and yeah he, he was fouled but I can understand why the referee might have missed that because at first glance it didn't seem to be too much in it it's only when you slow it down 
But then beat on when you're on a yellow, you know. I just thought it was a bit, bit reckless, but mm. you know, you take take one for the team and all that kind of stuff. But you're thinking, you know, I did have sympathy for him because it was Taylor that put him in that situation. Let's let's be frank here, you know, he could have been handled better. But and Beaton's been playing exceptionally well. You know, I'm not I'm not a great lover of him, but I had to give credit and praise where it's due. He has been playing really, really well, and he has been uh, doing what he was asked. Let's put it that way, and showing a good range of passing and being that anchor in the midfield. And mm-hmm. yeah, he will be sadly missed. And now that void, you're thinking, who fills it? Fine. As for the captain, it has to be Joe Hart, doesn't it? Surely? I'd go Joe Hart. Yeah, I'd go Joe Hart because he can. He's got a kind of panoramic view of everything, hasn't he? Or whatever you want to call it. So I would. Uh, it was a natural thing to give it to Joe Hart because he's quite voice suffering and he's been good for the dressing room anyway. So that would be my captain. As for who goes in there, then you, you know, people are saying, oh, they've got the fear of McCarthy going in there. You know, this is why McCarthy was bought, was it not? To maybe make a contribution in these kind of games. And if you're going to step up to the plate in any game, then make it this one. The time is now. The time is now for, for the likes of McCarthy or or I, I go back to it and you say, I know players have got natural position, but do you think about bringing Juranovic into that midfield and bring and bringing Ralston back? Uh, and just kind of swap swap those two? Because Juranovic can play there. You don't, I don't know if you want to tinker with the team that much of the formation, but because I agree, Yota and Abada are the wide men. Mm-hmm. Jakimakis will have to start up front, I think. But then again, he might, he might not. But then who do you put in there? So there's all sorts of tinkering that you could do with the team. But uh, I just think that see it, see it, McDermott Park. I thought McCarthy showed a wee bit, but what he was about, what he was made of, was the best I'd seen him. He was hitting long passes into guys, and they were finding feet. And he was quite solid in there, and I, and I think he could do that job. I know, there's, you know, some sales folks are all you know they, they feel the worst, but this guy's got a wealth of knowledge and experience at, at both club level and international level and at English Premier League level. I'm sure he could handle a Celtic v Rangers match. I'm sure he could handle it. So I really have no qualms. I, I'm, the qualms are about his his fitness, really, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Maintaining that intensity uh, that we know is going to be up to another few notches because of who we're playing. But just as you were talking there, this comment came in from AGSC Tech. We shouldn't pull any left field moves with the start of loving. Lennon used to try that to uh, flummox the opponents, but it only disrupted us. Yeah. But I can see you're thinking with Juranovic. I'm looking at that number six, and I'll throw this one to yourself, Amy. And the two options, if you don't want to tinker with it a wee bit, although I, I totally get the Juranovic option, because you know you've got a left and a right back who can cover uh, pretty comfortably in this fixture. The other two options really are Sorrow or James McCarthy. Now, there's going to be people watching this thinking, oh, but Paul, you think McCarthy's the messiah, he's the second coming. I don't, actually. I just think the time is now. There, there came a point in the season where Staffield just had to step up, right? We know it's been difficult for you, but now it's just time to step up. You're a four and a half million pound international defender. Let's start performing. And I think he has. James McCarthy's come in on a lengthy deal with all that experience, bags of experience. It's his dream move. And if it's going to happen, then Wednesday's the opportunity for that to happen because he's a natural in that position. My concerns echo Tony's when it comes to McCarthy. Can he maintain that intensity of the normal Ange game? But then you add the fact that we're playing Rangers on top of that and it's going to heighten it as well. And then you say, well, Soros got a fair bit of kind of experience in that fixture but he's probably going to be booked within three minutes if you play him because he doesn't seem to you know play any other way than the sorrow way which we've seen effective by the way we've seen him being very effective so that's your real option that's your options as a number six Amy I'm going to go when I pick my team I'm going to go for McCarthy and people are saying ah well there's a surprise but what's your kind of take on the number six position to replace Beaton? 
It has to be because sorrow cannot be anywhere near the side. Um, <laughs> I think you're being extremely generous that you think you would even last three minutes um, without getting a book in. No, it does have to be McCarthy. Um, I agree. I don't know how long we have been saying that it's time for McCarthy to step up, but well, it's been however many months since August. Don't, can't count. Um, it's been a long time, but it, the time is now and it has to be. Um, you know, we're talking about guys that get get it. It is his dream move. It was his dream move. He's got the dream move. Now it's time to show how much of a dream move it was. Um, you don't need to, you know, try and build up the fixture for him or anything like that. He certainly will get that. Um, it just it will have to be McCarthy. I, the, I do always have that thought on my mind uh, over the last few days that, oh, McGregor's going to come out. That team line's going to be dropped. McGregor's got, name's going to be there. The captain's armband's going to be beside him. But I just, that's just, I think that's just been silly. Um, and I don't think unless McGregor's 100%, you don't you don't risk him. Um, because although how big this game is, it's still only one game. Um, and you don't want to risk McGregor being out for even longer. Um, so I think it'd be sensible to not play McGregor would I be surprised if he did though and saying that? No, I wouldn't be surprised if he started. But again, that's just probably just been a little bit too hopeful. But I think it will have to be James McCarthy, um, especially if the only other option is Sorrow, because to me that's just not an option. We've seen McCarthy, uh, sorry, not McCarthy, McGregor with, with the Vim Janssen tribute. His face still looks bloated and yeah. swollen and bruised. We've seen occasions in the past, Tony, where clubs have, you know, they've gone out their way to try and make a player ready. And sometimes that involves masks. So players have played as if they've got a part in the Phantom of the Opera and they're on. I'm with Amy on this one. You know, unless there's no risk to the player, that that injury is going to be even worsened. He's got to miss it out. He's got to miss out. And then you've got to go down to what will be your third choice, number six. Because obviously Beaton has shown that he is the guy that comes in. It would be your third choice, number six at that stage. Who is that? Is it McCarthy? Is it Sorrow? Um, these are some of the big questions that will be answered about an hour before kickoff on Wednesday night. So we're going for Joe Hart as a captain then and James McCarthy starting as a number six. We've got yeah. three agreements on that. I think that's... Well, you know, I guess you just you just don't take a risk with a player like McGregor. You know, and <laughs> I go back to what I said. You just you don't rule out Ange throwing in that curveball, do you? You just don't rule out. There'll be a mask out there that can protect uh, you know, them. Somebody's yeah, building yeah, a mask right now. Yeah, of course there is. Me. Uh, <laughs> you know, but unless it's unless everything all falls into place, then. I would fully expect to see McGregor miss this one out. Mm. Let's be honest, it's uh, of course Celtics need and want and desire to beat Rangers is great. But you know, if I would say it, it's not a the must win. You know, it's the mustn't lose. You know, if you even if they, they, they get a draw, it's not the worst result possible because you're still two points, you're still within striking distance. Not saying I want them to get a draw, but because I think Celtic are capable of beating this Rangers team. But you've got to accept that there are influential players, key players missing from the Celtic lineup. Yeah. So you're playing to go top if you win. Great. By all means, you know, go for it. Let's see what it takes us. But it's not a disaster if they don't win. And by that, I mean by drawing, you know, because you're still there. You're, you're breathing down Rangers' necks. So, but I'd just like to see Celtic go out and win and see how Rangers handle the pressure of being the chasing team. That's what I want to see happen. I think that dynamic, there could be a, a dynamic chip, you know, change there, a seismic shift, you know, real sea change. It becomes a, a more, more pressure on Rangers then. So I think if Celtic hit the front, then they could potentially take some stopping. Well, the, the the thing is, Tony, we've, we've not seen them. We've never seen them with Celtic breathing down their neck for some time. It didn't happen last season. And am I right in saying Celtic haven't dropped a point since we reconvened in January? Correct. So, I want to keep that going as well. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. In case anybody says about, oh, it's always a must-win game against Rangers, I'm talking about the actual, of course it's always a must-win game against Rangers, but I'm talking about it's not disastrous 
if you don't win it, and by that I mean a draw, I don't know, talking about defeat, never entertain that. Because we're going to be stronger in the second half of the season, Tony. You yeah. know, when we've got a full complement of staff or that's, full complement of players. That's yeah. what I mean. So we kind of get wrapped up and that this is the be all and end all because it's not an end of the season game. We still have players to come back. You'll still be in and around that title race. And so it's, you know, I think we just kind of we take the match on its own merit as opposed to building it up to be something that it isn't. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Tony, um, Amy wants McGregor to start. She wants us to sign Carter Vickers and Jota today and we need to win on Wednesday night. So there's the two I'm ends of the scale. I'm not asking a lot, to be honest. <laughs> I, know, I know, What's the matter with that? Nothing. You know, what, you know, Girl can dream. Correct. And who, who are Celtic to turn down Amy's wishes? Exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Tony, exactly. What are we exactly. saying? Chill exactly. Pill has got to be McCarthy. Sorrow cannot be trusted. I do have my concerns, Chill yeah. Pill. Um, I want to talk about Matt O'Reilly, though. I mean, since coming into the side, two games, two excellent performances. Um, I think he was he was certainly my man in the match on Saturday. Um, there's been some passages of play where the intensity in which he receives and, and distributes the ball is frightening. It just fits in so well to Angie's game plan. Um, he went on about the atmosphere at Tynecastle. He's then obviously enjoyed the atmosphere at Celtic Park. It's just levels. He's gone up a couple of notches. And then the big one on Wednesday night. Amy, he doesn't seem to be the type of guy who will get the old stage fright. He seems to have taken everything, everything in, his, in his stride so far. Yeah, he's been, you know, what a signing so far. And I'm not trying to, you know... As Tony says, keep feet on ground um, and all that jazz. But he's really came in just looking like like the real deal. Another guy who's younger than me, um, but yeah, he just he, he's playing like so beyond his years. Um, he's not afraid, you know. That debut at, at Tynecastle, he was in and around everything. I think mm-hmm. it's even like little things, like he's been in the door however many days and he's already on corners. Like that shows you how bad Celtic are from corners. But you know, the, and but the deliveries. They were they were decent, um, certainly going by Celtic standards. So, just for them to come in and to look so integrated already, you know, we're talking about the the jubilation and the celebrations after Saturday. It really was right in there as well with Abada. You know, there was that little moment just the two of them. You know, he's just already, you know, getting getting in into it really. Um, so yeah, I think. You know, when we all kind of obviously worked it out that if Rogic went on international duty that they were most likely that he'd be missing the 2nd of February, then there was a lot of concern because you're thinking, oh my God, who's going to be like the creative instinct? And that was even when McGregor was still even an option. But I think the fact that we're not even talking right now that like the Rogic void's really been filled by O'Reilly already. And again, I'm a massive Tom Rogic fan and I didn't really think anybody would be able to slot in and do what he does. And I'm not saying they're the same player because Rogic just has, you know, he's, he is just a magician. But O'Reilly has managed to fill it to a degree that nobody is talking about the omission of Rogic, you know. Um, I think when he comes back, it'll be extremely interesting because if O'Reilly keeps us up, you know, you, you can't drop a player like this. So I don't know how many players there can play in a midfield at a time. Um, but I think Angel need to try and figure that one out. Um, but it's a good headache to have, you know. It's that total cliche. But I think it just shows you, though, that why Ange went for O'Reilly. Because he's just offering everything attacking that you mm-hmm. think, you know, that's the nugget that Ange's style needs. Just that little creator. Um, you know, I, I think... It, He's just been a joy to watch so far, like a proper joy to watch. And um, yeah, I think he's got a massive career in front of him itself. Like. When you look at that midfield and Turnbull's missing, Rogic, McGregor, Beaton, they're all missing, Tony. You've got O'Reilly who's come in, played two games at Tati, a couple of games under his belt. Is that a concern for you or do you think it's the old Lubo Moravchik trick where, you know, he shrugs his shoulders and gets on with it? Do you know what? You, you looked at Hatati and O'Reilly and you, you couldn't tell that they've played two games together. Could you? Because they, no. look, they look as if they've been in that team since the start of the season. That's how seamlessly they're fitted in. Again, going back to the manager, bringing in players who are first team ready and can play the system. So, and O'Reilly's been very impressive, hasn't he? Really impressive. You know, the setup for Jack and Marcus goal, delivery bang on the money. He'll be kicking himself that he never scored on Saturday, yeah. but he did a lot of Everything positive was coming from O'Reilly on Saturday, especially in the first half. You know, it came from Jota in the second. 
But you know my thoughts on these things always. You, you can't get enough good players in your team. And I was, I was looking like a decent player. You know, it's only been a couple of games in which you don't want to go overboard, but you look at him and you think, you'll do. You know, you've looked at Hitati and you've thought, wow. You know, and, and I'm talking about the, for the amount of money we've paid for these guys. You know, you look and you think, they're there. They're going to be cracking players once they settle in and really get to, to know the club and, and, and their teammates. Because I mean, we, I was at Tin Castle and you know, Hatati was asked how did he feel to be playing alongside O'Reilly and he said that a time when a guy once or something or twice at best and they were thrown together. But you wouldn't have known that in that first half display at Tincastle uh, last Wednesday. So again, on Saturday, they were very influential and effective. So I I think they, given time, they'll they'll turn into cracking players for Celtic. But as you say, it needs must. You have to puff out the chest and throw back your shoulders and say, bring it on, let's do it, and let's see see what they've got. But, you know, that, that's why you sign for a club like Celtic. You want to play in these games. You want to make your mark in these games. Because you know fine well you you can ascertain hero and legend status overnight. If that doesn't flick your switch, then you're at the wrong club. I'm sorry, you know what I mean? And, uh, and the manager will be telling them that as well, in no uncertain terms. The stage is set. The team that I'm going for, and I want you to tell me if you agree or disagree, is Joe Hart in goals and also with the captain's armband. With Juranovic, Taylor, Cameron Carter, Vickers and Starfelt. In the midfield, it's McCarthy, O'Reilly and Hatati with Abada, Yakamakis and Yota up top. What's your thoughts on that, Amy? Any changes to that lineup? No, I am not. I think that's it. <laughs> what about yourself, Tori? Is there any changes you'd make to that? I mean, no, I it's, it's a needs must in the midfield, isn't it? In my head, that was the team I was going for. Unless, he you know, says the curveball of Callum McGregor comes into play. Uh, that's probably the, the way you would set up and what you would do. And I still think momentum's with Celtic and that they can win this game. I've not, I don't. I think at any stage that I've, I've been negative and sort of turned down, but I think Rangers are there for the taking. Celtic have got to go out and perform the way that they, they know they can and be a bit more clinical in front of goal. That's all, that's all you would ask. I think that's all the manager would ask, but they'll have the backing of the home support who and these guys will get to know Celtic Park at its best. You know, and, and if so, so you, you take that atmosphere and then if you can win the title, they'll be getting into the Champions League on nights like that. That's that's quite a powerful thing. That can help you, you know, persuade the likes of maybe Jota and Carter Vickers that their future lies with Celtic. Absolutely. That, that's how big this is. Yeah, Wednesday night can't come quickly enough, but we've got transfer deadline uh, to deal with. If anything big happens in the world of Celtic, we'll have a wee impromptu podcast broadcast for you. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. 1,200 strong plus on the chat. Uh, you've been watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch and Twitter. If you haven't done so already, get yourself subscribing to the YouTube channel for loads of daily content. And uh, We updated and uh, uploaded, rather, the Alan Thompson interview yesterday so get that watched and like it uh, and give me some feedback as well all that's left for me to say is thank you to Tony Hagerty and Amy Canavan for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind 